Chapter Three of Ox Team Days on the Oregon Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. Ox Team Days on the Oregon Trail by Ezra Meeker and Howard Driggs. Chapter Three, Leaving the Home Nest for Iowa. In the early fifties there lived near Indianapolis two young people. Their fathers were old-time farmers, keeping no hired men, and buying very little store goods. The girl could spin and weave, make delicious butter, knit soft, well-shaped socks, and cook as good a meal as any other country girl around. She was, with all, as boxum a lass as ever grew in Indiana. The young man was a little uncouth in appearance, round-faced, rather stout in build, almost fat. He loved to hunt possums and coons in the woods round about. He was a little boisterous, always restless, and not especially polished in manners. Yet he had at least one redeeming trait of character. He loved to work, and was known to be as industrious a lad as any in the neighborhood. These two young people grew up to the age of manhood and womanhood, knowing but little of the world outside their home sphere. Who can say that they were not as happy as if they had seen the whole world? Had they not experienced the joys of the sugar camp, while stirring off the lively creeping maple sugar? Both had been thumped upon the bare head by the falling hickory nuts in windy weather, had hunted the black walnuts half hidden in the leaves, had scraped the ground for the elusive beech nuts. They had ventured to apple parings together when not yet out of their teens. "'I'm going to be a farmer when I get married,' the lad quite abruptly said to the lass one day without any previous conversation to lead up to the statement. His companion showed by her confusion that she had not mistaken what was in his mind. After a while she remarked, Yes, I want to be a farmer too, but I want to be a farmer on our own land. Two bargains were confirmed then and there when the lad said, We will go west and not live on Pap's farm, and she responded, Nor in the old cabin, nor any cabin unless it's our own. So the resolution was made that they would go to Iowa, get some land, and grow up with the country. About the first week of October, in 1851, a covered wagon drew up in front of Thomas Sumner's home, then but four miles out of Indianapolis on the National Road. It was ready to be loaded for the start. Eliza Jane, Thomas Sumner's second daughter, the last already described, was now the wife of the young man mentioned, the author. She also was ready for the journey. She had prepared supplies enough to last all the way, cake and butter and pumpkin pies, jellies and the like, with plenty of substantials besides. The two young people had plenty of blankets, a good-sized Dutch oven, an extra pair of shoes apiece, cloth for two dresses for the wife, and an extra pair of trousers for the husband. Tears could not be restrained as the loading progressed, and the realization faced the parents of both that the young people were about to leave them. Why, mother, we are only going to Iowa, you know, where we can get a home that shall be our own. It's not so far away, only about five hundred miles. Yes, I know, but suppose you get sick in that uninhabited country. Who will take care of you? Notwithstanding this motherly solicitude, the young people could not fail to know that there was a secret feeling of approval in the good woman's breast. After a few miles' travel, the reluctant final parting came. We could not then know that this loved parent would lay down her life a few years later in a heroic attempt to follow the wanderers to Oregon. She rests in an unknown and unmarked grave in the Platte Valley. What shall I say of that October drive from the home near Indianapolis to Eddyville, Iowa, in the delightful atmosphere of Indian summer? It was an atmosphere of hope and content. We had the wide world before us we had good health, and above all we had each other. At this time but one railroad entered Indianapolis. It would be called a tramway now, from Madison on the Ohio River. When we cut loose from that embryo city we left railroads behind us, except where rails were laid crosswise in the wagon track to keep the wagon out of the mud. No matter if the road was rough, we could go a little slower, and shouldn't we have a better appetite for supper because of the jolting and sleep the sounder? Everything in the world looked bright. The great Mississippi was crossed at Burlington. After a few days of further driving, we arrived at Eddyville in Iowa. 
though we did not realize it at the time, this was destined to be only a place to winter, a way station on our route to Oregon. My first introduction to an Iowa winter was in a surveyor's camp on the western borders of the state. This was a little north of Canesville, now Council Bluffs. I began as cook for the camp, but very soon changed this position for that of flagman. If there are any settlers now left of the Iowa of that day, they will remember that the winter was bitter cold. On the way back from the surveying party to Eddyville, just before Christmas, I encountered one of the bitterest of those bitter days. A companion named Vance rested with me overnight in a cabin. We had scant food for ourselves, or for the mare we led. It was thirty-five miles to the next cabin. We must reach that place, or lie out in the snow. So a very early start was made before daybreak, while the wind lay. The good woman of the cabin baked us some biscuits for a noon lunch, but they were frozen solid in our pockets before we had been out two hours. The wind rose with the sun, and with the sun two bright sun-dogs, a beautiful sight to behold, but arising from conditions intolerable to bear. Vance came near freezing to death, and would have done so had I not succeeded in arousing him to anger and getting him off the mare. I vowed then and there that I did not like the Iowa climate, and the Oregon fever that had already seized me was heightened. The settlement of the northern boundary by treaty in 1846 had ended the dispute between the United States and Great Britain for ownership of the region north of the Columbia. As a consequence, American settlers were beginning to cross the Columbia in numbers, and stories were coming back of the wonderful climate, the rich soil, and the wealth of lumber. The Oregon country of that day included the present states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, and parts of Montana and Wyoming. It was a special consideration for us that if we went to Oregon, the government would give us three hundred and twenty acres of land, whereas in Iowa we should have to purchase it. The price would be low, to be sure, but the land must be bought and paid for on the spot. There were no preemption laws or beneficial homestead laws in force then, nor did they come until many years later. But what about going to Oregon when springtime came? An event was pending that rendered a positive decision impossible for the moment. It was not until the first week of April, 1852, when our first-born baby boy was a month old, that we could say we were going to Oregon in 1852. It would be a long, hard journey for such a little fellow, but as it turned out, he stood it like a young hero. By 1850, the general divisions of the continent had taken the shape that they have today. The states of Texas and California, and the territories of Utah and New Mexico, had been added to the United States, all as a result of the war with Mexico. The dispute with Great Britain over the Oregon country had been settled by a compromise. The region just west of the Missouri, known as the Nebraska Territory, was still beyond the frontier. End of chapter 3